I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the sixth chapter of the OpenStax Psychology textbook. Today we'll be discussing learning. So we'll ask questions like, what is learning? And learn about classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning. So we'll start by talking about instincts and reflexes, which are both types of innate behaviors. So reflexes are motor or neural reactions to a specific stimulus in the environment. So a reflex would be like your knee jerk reflex or the patellar reflex. So you hit your knee and it kicks out or the pupillary light reflex, where if I shine a light into your eye, your uh, pupil shrinks to because it doesn't want that much light coming in. And reflexes involve more primitive areas of the central nervous system. Instincts are more innate behaviors that are triggered by a broader range of events. So more complex patterns of behavior. So that's a honey badger and he does a lot of complex behaviors. It involves the movement of the organism as a whole and involves higher brain centers. So the honey badger, nobody has to tell him to go find honey or to fight with snakes. He's gonna do that on instinct. Learning, however, is a relatively permanent change in behavior or knowledge that results from experience. And we have a number of different types of learning that we're gonna talk about, but they're all related to associative learning. And that occurs when you make connections between stimuli or events that occur together in the environment. This used to be referred to as temporal contiguity, where things come together in time, and it's really central to both types of conditioning and observational learning. So in classical conditioning, we learn to associate events or stimuli that repeatedly happen together. And that's also sometimes known as Pavlovian conditioning. In operant conditioning, you learn to associate events. So basically a behavior and its consequences. And that's B.F. Skinner. He would say that behavior is controlled by its uh, consequences. And so we'll talk about things like reinforcements and punishments. And observational learning extends the effective range of both classical and operant conditioning. And it's the process of watching others and then imitating what they do. So in classical conditioning, this is a process by which we learn to associate stimuli and anticipate events. Now, the person who came up with this is Ivan Pavlov. Does the name Pavlov ring a bell? Here's another bad joke. Uh, how does Pavlov keep his hair so soft and smooth? Classical conditioning. Now, Pavlov discovers, I'll wait while you laugh, he discovers the relationship uh, in his work with dogs. Now, he wasn't actually studying learning. He was actually studying digestion and he wins the Nobel Prize in Physiology and it's either 1906 or 1903, I'm drawing a blank. But um, so classical conditioning is something he serendipitously discovers while studying dog digestion. And it's got a couple different components to it. So we have an unconditioned stimulus or UCS, and that's a stimulus that elicits a reflective, res reflexive response in an organism. So for example, meat powder makes dogs salivate. They don't have to be taught to like meat powder. They just like it. So unconditioned means unlearned. That leads to an unconditioned response, which is a natural reaction to a given stimulus, which is the salivation. So uh, UCS causes a UCR. Now we can have a neutral stimulus too, and that could be something like a tone. And that a neutral stimulus means that it doesn't elicit any response on its own, but we're gonna pair that with the meat powder, the unconditioned stimulus. And so you have a conditioned stimulus and that elicits a response after being repeatedly paired with the unconditioned stimulus. So you take a tone and you uh, pair that with the meat powder and then the animal will start salivating to the tone. And that becomes a conditioned response. So the behavior is caused by the conditioned stimulus and you've classically conditioned that dog to respond to a tone. Well, there's some general processes in con classical conditioning. And one is what's called higher order conditioning. And this is when you pair a new neutral stimulus with the conditioned stimulus. So let's say you have a cat and the cat gets excited 
uh, anytime that the um, can opener runs because it knows that's going to lead to him getting his food. A higher order conditioning would be if your cat gets excited when it hears you open the cabinet that has the can opener in it because um, they know that hearing the cabinet open means that the can opener is going to come out and then they're going to get fed. And so that's higher order um, conditioning. Now, acquisition and extinction, I'm going to talk about next. And they both in, they involve the strengthening and weakening of a learned association. So in acquisition, that's the initial period of learning. And that's when a neutral stimulus is connected to the unconditioned stimulus and eventually becomes a conditioned stimulus. Extinction is a, de a decrease uh, in the conditioned response when the unconditioned stimulus is no longer presented um, with the conditioned stimulus. So uh, if you just have the tone but no meat powder, then the dog will eventually stop salivating. Spontaneous recovery is the return of a previously extinguished conditioned response following a rest period. So if you were if you had stopped pairing the uh, meat powder with the tone and then you restart pairing the meat powder with the tone then the dog will start salivating again to the tone because he has spontaneously recovered that association stimulus discrimination um, is when you respond differently to various stimuli that are similar so what happens is you demonstrate the condition response only to the condition stimulus. So the dog doesn't salivate to every tone, just the one that has been paired with food. Now the opposite of this is stimulus generalization. When they demonstrate the condition response, response to stimuli that are similar to the condition stimulus. And so that means they just hear any tone and they start salivating. Because hey, maybe that's going to lead to food. Habituation is when they learn not to respond to a stimulus that's presented repeatedly uh, without change. So it's basically like tuning something out. Well, John Watson, who's pictured to the right there, he's the founder of behaviorism. And he believed that psychology must focus on the outward behavior that can be observed and measured. And he had no regard for unobservable internal processes like consciousness, which is what many psychologists of his time, like Wundt, were interested in. Actually, Wundt um, uh, passes away in 1920, and um, Watson's active in the 19-teens. He's famous for the Little Albert study, and this demonstrated how fears can be conditioned. And you may be familiar with this. Uh, this has kind of worked its way into popular culture. What Watson did was he had Little Albert, and he tested to see if he was afraid of a white rat or... Um, rabbits and he wasn't. And so with any what he started doing was pairing the white rat with a loud sound. So he would he would strike a bar behind Albert's head and he, then he started getting afraid of the rat. But he eventually became afraid of a whole bunch of different things. He, he, it was stimulus generalization. He became afraid of rabbits, white furry coats, and there's a famous picture, uh, which is not there, of Watson wear wearing a Santa Claus mask. What kind of person makes a child afraid of a Santa Claus mask? John Watson. What Watson was trying to show was that phobias can be created through conditioning and Freud's idea of hidden conflicts causing phobias was just wrong, that there was a simpler explanation. Now, he intended to decondition little Albert so he wouldn't be afraid, but uh, he actually, his family moved away, and so he was unable to do that. Operant conditioning is when you learn to associate a behavior with its consequences. So B.F. Skinner is uh, really the founder of operant conditioning, and he builds on the research of Edward Thorndike. Now, Thorndike came up with the law of effect, and he said that behaviors that are followed by consequences that are satisfying, actually what he called a satisfier, um, those are more likely to be repeated. And behaviors that are followed by unpleasant consequences, which he actually called a punisher, are less likely to be repeated. Now, Skinner became famous for his operant conditioning apparatus or chamber, which we would today call a Skinner box. And that's how they're able to learn. Actually, that was the, the name that everybody else called it. Um, Skinner liked to be 
um, call it the operant conditioning apparatus, though. So in, I want to make this clear to you, too. In operant conditioning, positive and negative don't mean good and bad. Instead, positive means adding something, and negative means taking something away. Reinforcement means increasing a behavior, and punishment means you're decreasing a behavior. So putting all of this together, we can talk about positive reinforcement. That is a when a desirable stimulus is added to increase a behavior. So for example, you might pay kids to read books and find that the reading comprehension goes up because they're reading more books. Um, that actually leads to something else too called the overjustification effect, which is when you pay people to do something that they like to do anyway, they start to like it less. And um, we'll talk about that uh, perhaps in another chapter. Negative reinforcement is when an undesirable stimulus is removed to increase a behavior. So you have beeping on your dashboard until you put on your seatbelt. And so you want to uh, increase the behavior of people strapping in. And so you have an undesirable stimulus, the beep, 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 until you um, actually put on your seatbelt. Now, punishment always decreases the behavior. And you can have positive and negative punishment. So positive punishment is when you add an undesirable stimulus to decrease the behavior. So for example, if I don't want students to text in class, which actually, uh, in complete honesty, I don't mind st uh, students texting in class. That's, that's the world we live in. But if I, if I considered that a behavior that I wanted to, to decrease, I could yell at them. So that's an undesirable stimulus. Who wants to get yelled at in class? A negative punishment is when you remove a pleasant stimulus to decrease a behavior. So let's say a child is crying, you might take away a favorite toy to make them cry less. And so you would say, you want something to cry about, I'm gonna take your, your favorite toy away. Now, as you can imagine, punishment has its problems that uh, children might become to fear the punisher and they may become aggressive and antisocial. Surprise, surprise, you take a kid's favorite toy away, they become antisocial. So if you have kids, you really want to favor reinforcement over punishment. Skinner also talks about shaping, and this is when you reward successive approximations of a target behavior. So you break the behavior down into many small achievable steps, and then you reinforce those. And this is used in teaching complex behaviors or chains of behaviors. So uh, Skinner taught pigeons to play ping pong. And there was a video I used to show uh, uh, where they had raccoons playing basketball. They trained them to do that. So if you want to apply this with children, if you want them uh, to clean their room, first have them pick up one toy, then five, and then 10, and then everything but a few and then finally have them clean the whole room. So you're rewarding successive approximations of the behavior that you want. A primary reinforcer uh, is an, has innate reinforcing qualities that are, you don't have to teach people. So things like food, water, sleep, shelter, and sex. A secondary reinforcer has no inherent value, uh, but it's been linked with the primary reinforcer. So something like money, money allows you to get uh, things like water and food, and we'll just pass over everything else. Tokens are secondary reinforcers that can be traded for rewards and prizes. And so entire behavior management systems are built on what are called token economies, uh, where people can exchange tokens for privileges or like television or something like that. And uh, analogous to this is when children are given gold stars at school and they get excited about completing things. Let's talk about continuous and partial reinforcement. In continuous reinforcement, uh, you re receive a reinforcer each time you display a particular behavior. And in partial reinforcement, you don't get reinforced every time. Um, and there's different, uh, you can see off to the right there too what the breakdown's like, but uh, when it's fixed reinfo partial reinforcement, there's a set number of responses or amount of time between the responses. If it's variable, then you change the number of responses or, or the amount of time between responses. Interval means 
uh, it's t the time between reinforcements in ratio means that it's based on the number of re uh, responses. And I think this is a little more clear on this slide where a fixed interval reinforcement schedule, the behavior is rewarded after a set amount of time. So for example, in a hospital, a patient may be able to do pain relief where they can press a button, say every 20 minutes that the doctor says, well, every 20 minutes you can press the button and um, you'll get some pain relief. Now, this is the least productive um, method of reinforcement because, uh, or schedule of reinforcement, because you know once the you've pressed the button and gotten the pain relief, you're not gonna be able to, pressing it more doesn't get you more pain relief. It's gonna be 20 minutes before you get more pain relief. And so it's the easiest one to extinguish too. A variable interval reinforcement schedule is when a person or animal gets the reinforcement based on varying amounts of time. And this could be something like checking Facebook, which can be very reinforcing. Uh, did somebody like my, my picture or something like that? But you might, um, well, some people might have it on all day, but you might look at it, say, you know, sometimes like five times in the morning, and then you may not look at it all, all day, and then once in the evening or something. And so it's a variable interval. A fixed ratio reinforcement schedule is a set number of responses that must occur before the reward. And this is something like piecework, where you do, uh, if, you, if you're manufacturing something that you get paid for, let's say, every five widgets that you create. And so, um, yeah, once you get five, you get paid. A variable ratio reinforcement schedule is when there's an unpredictable number of responses needed for a reward. And this is considered the most productive because uh, you don't know when the payoff's coming. And so you keep on doing the behavior and it's also the most resistant to extinction because maybe if you do that behavior one more time, this time you get uh, paid for it. And the um, example of this is gambling. And so people, sometimes they get they hit the payoff. Uh, Skinner talks about uh, this with, um, oh, what do they call those slot machines where uh, sometimes you get paid off and you don't know, maybe it's every hundredth time you play or maybe it's every second time you play, uh, but it, it varies. And so you keep on playing. It's very resistant to extinction. Let's talk about Tolman's research. Now he does experiments with rats that showed that they learned even if they didn't receive immediate reinforcement. And this is a big deal in behaviorism because they believed that reinforcement was necessary in order, in order for learning to occur. So what Tolman did is he had rats run the maze for 10 sessions without reinforcement, and then he put food into the goal box and it's list, list, labeled as food box on the, the maze. Now, what he said, oh, so what happened is they learned as quickly as rats who were reinforced the entire time. And what Tolman said is that the rats created what he called a cognitive map, which is a mental picture of the maze in their brain. And so this is, behaviorists don't like that either because again, you're studying things that we can't observe. And so we can't actually see this cognitive map. And they had latent learning, which meant that learning was occurring, but it wasn't observable until there was a reason to demonstrate it. So they didn't have to show that they knew how to run the maze until there was food involved. And then they started running the maze correctly. If you want a, a human example of this, that could be like, maybe you don't know how to drive a manual transmission, but you've seen people drive it. And then if um, you're in some emergency situation where you would have to learn or you would have to drive a manual transmission. Uh, maybe you need to get somebody to the hospital and all that's available is a manual sports car. Then you would probably burn through the gears and get them to the hospital. Observational learning is learning by watching others and then imitating or modeling what they say or do. And so the individual performing the imitated behavior is called the model. And so in that picture, which is also in your textbook, the airman who's drinking the water is, he's the model and he's modeling the behavior of drinking from a water bottle, which is being uh, done by the monkey. It's, so the monkey's doing, it's a, that's a um, spider monkey. And he's modeling how the, the airman 
drinks from a bottle. Research suggests that this imitative learning requires the special kind of neuron called a motor neuron. And this theory was actually developed as a type of behaviorism by Albert Bandura, who called it social learning theory. And there's several ways that observational learning can occur. So you might use it to learn a new response or to choose whether or not to imitate depending on the outcome or the consequences of imitating um, the behavior. And you learn a general rule that you can apply in other situations. So Bandura says that there's three kinds of models. A live model demonstrates the behavior in person for you. And a verbal model doesn't perform the behavior, but it instead explains it. So that might be like a coach who doesn't want to get out of the golf cart, but they just tell people what to do. So they just kind of yell at you from their golf cart and tell you what to do. A symbolic model, those can be fictional characters or real people who demonstrate behaviors in books, movies, TV, video games, or internet sources. And this would be like watching an exercise video or a yoga video or somebody teaching you how to do something uh, via the internet. Now there's four specific steps that must be followed if learning is to be successful. So you have to pay attention to what the model is doing. That's attention. You have to remember what they did. That's retention. You have to be able to perform that behavior yourself. That's reproduction. And uh, then your motivation will depend on what happened to the model. And so he calls this vicarious reinforcement and punishment. So being motivated to imitate the behavior because you saw the model reinforced for their behavior is vicarious reinforcement. And vicarious punishment is being less motivated to imitate the behavior because you saw the model punished for their behavior. We can also have pro-social models. Oh, and actually to, to talk about this too, so with the punishment too, uh, if you see someone yelled at in class for texting, then you might not text in class then too. So pro-social models, let's end this on a positive note, can be used to encourage socially acceptable behavior. So if you want your children to read, you should read and they should see you reading. And this works for other behavior too, like honesty, kindness, and courtesy. So you should model the behaviors that you want to see in your own children. And that's Albert Bandura off to the right. He would agree with me. Let's finish up by saying that all your problems, at least all your APA style problems, uh, are easily solved by using my APA style, Learn APA style book. So when you want to learn to write correctly or write right, Consult my book and videos on Learn APA Style, which are about writing and psychology and the social sciences. Thanks for listening.